half in the bag. Parents just don't understand. Apparently we're getting product placement now from Starbucks, Jay. Is that why you're drinking Starbucks now, Jay? Because they desperately need the advertising from us? Yeah, you know, I was drinking that Starbucks when we were talking about Avengers Endgame, and I think there was some misconceptions that it was product placement, but what it really was, was just foreshadowing for the next Game of Thrones. <laughs> you know Game of Thrones, it's that show that everybody hates now. Except for Aaron Rodgers. Oh yeah, what's that about? Him, he has a cameo on it, or he's claimed to have a cameo on it or something? Uh, which he, I think was a joke? No, he does have a cameo. Oh, he does. He, I, but no one could really narrow down where it's at. They think he might be a, a arrow guy in, in like five, ten arrow guys. He's there. They show a picture of him on set, and he's like covered in mud, and he's like. He teased a Milwaukee news reporter like six months ago. Is this episode, happening? Episode five, Game of Thrones. I'm ready. And the news reporter was like, "Ha ah, ha, what? What are you saying?" <laughs> and then they went back and they looked at the footage. They're like, "Oh my God, he told us about it. He told us about it." It was like embarrassing. It's like 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 a hidden meaning, hidden was, message. Yeah. Kind of like that film that nobody saw called Under the Silver Lake. Wait a minute, there was hidden messages in Under the Silver Lake. What do you get when you combine David Lynch, Thomas Pynchon, Alfred Hitchcock by way of Brian De Palma, and more plot threads than Avengers Endgame? You get Under the Silver Lake, a movie so baffling that even the marketing geniuses at A24 didn't know what to do with it. And they sold people on It Comes at Night, a movie that's just 90 minutes of people trying to figure out who opened a door. Under the Silver Lake stars one of the prettiest actresses to grace the silver screen, Andrew Garfield. Mike, we're here to talk about a movie that nobody's seen, apparently, called Under the Silver Lake. Uh, we were just going to do a Mike and Jay Talks About, which we did once before. Once for the, before. For the Clovehitch Killer. And then you watched the movie, and you said, let's talk a little bit more about it. Well, I, I have a lot to say about it. Um, this was, this was I, I actually saw the trailer for Under the Silver Lake six months ago. Longer, even. I don't even know. And I wrote it on a list, and because um, I like mostly everything A24 puts out. Can, can, the Cannes Film Festival happened and the, the marketing executives at A24 snapped their fingers and the movie disappeared. Uh, it floated into the Silver Lake <laughs> and, and a cloud of dust. But, but then you were like, hey, watch that movie. I was like, oh yeah, that movie's out. Um, and then I watched it and I really liked it after it sunk in and I want to talk a lot about it, uh, which may contain spoilers. Uh, the Jay and Mike review is just sort of like, hey, nah, check this out. It's a little really more good. vague. You yeah. probably haven't seen this. Hey, take a look. This needs a little bit of dissecting and we need to talk about the the, who made it, uh, how it got released. Um, how or didn't Amazon, get released. Or didn't get released, how Amazon <laughs> fucked up their encoding of the movie. Um, and I guess we'll talk about the movie too. And the movie too, because the movie's densely packed, I'll say that. But you said, watch a r real quick diversion here. Uh, and a little shout out to Amazon, because uh, I was highly irritated. <laughs> you said, go watch Under the Silver Lake. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. So I rented it on Amazon, and I was like, this looks like the end of Grease when the credits roll. <laughs> like the VHS version of Grease? Yes. When, uh, you know, you have a movie in widescreen or uh, uh, anamorphic aspect ratio. The 235 to 1 aspect right. ratio. And then a movie that, uh, that used to be in the 235 two, to 1 aspect ratio on a four by three television with credits, right? That, that spanned the screen. Mm -hmm. They would squish it so that everyone could read the credits. So when, uh, when John Travolta and, and Olivia Newton-John start dancing, we go together. This is like such a specific example. This was burning burn into your brain. Head. I always think of the, uh, the elevator scene in Ghostbusters. I remember watching that on TV and it's like, cause the framing of that shot is so specific and important to the joke and they didn't know what to do with it in the pan and scan version. So they were just like, boop. Well, well 
Well, yes, yes, exactly. I've seen pan and scans of Ghostbusters that do that. It depends on how yeah. you saw it. There's like the VHS one and there was one that played on TV. Right. So the movie looked like that because it's an anamorphic movie that was somehow encoded improperly to where it's squished to fit my 16 by nine TV. The trailer was encoded the same. We look up the trailer on YouTube, it's proper. And then I, I paid five bucks to rent it. Okay, so why is it in Sarah's room? And I'm not saying hashtag cancel Amazon <laughs> because of this. I'm just saying this particular movie was, was squished and somebody messed it up. Go ahead, check it out. Maybe it's just my Amazon. I really don't know. They have something against you personally. I could see people watching this and going, why does the movie look like this? The movie's got enough hurdles to get over without being in the wrong aspect ratio. Well, let's, let's talk <laughs> about the hurdles next. We have a lot to talk about before we get to the movie, so you're, you're free of spoilers from here on out, everybody. I shouldn't have drank that bottle of whiskey. Uh, well, the story is, this is Robert David Mitchell, right? Is that his name? Or David, David Robert Gordon Mitchell? Green. Or David Gordon Green? One of those guys, uh, he made It Follows, which was, of course, a, a smaller movie that kind of broke out, did really well. And so he gets his, his next movie, and they're giving him a little more free reign, do whatever you want. So he makes this big, uh, dense, two-and-a-half-hour, confusing nonsense movie. <laughs> Very ambitious, lots of plot threads. Um, and A24 is like, well, we gotta pick this up. It's the Follows guy. So they bought it, and then it premiered at the Cannes Film Festival to mediocre to negative reactions. And they said, oh, fuck. And so then they just, uh, they pushed back the release date, and then they just dumped it on VOD with like no notice, no uh, marketing behind it. There's not even like, I think there might be a DVD release, but there's, absolutely, there's no like Blu-ray. How is there just a DVD release? Because it's cheaper. cheaper. It's cheaper to put out why a DVD. Why even release it that's on why DVD there's, at all? There's a lot of stuff uh, that you can find at like Walmart that's like oh. DVD only. It's usually like cheapo horror movies. Um, Gosh, I can see the market for it now. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't blame them for not like release, trying to release this wide because it would tank horribly, but at least do like some theaters and the same day VOD and like promote it a bit. Um, but I guess they just lost all faith in it when it got negative reactions at the Cannes Film you, you Festival. Gotta, you gotta put a pile of, pile of DVDs at, at the hipster coffee shop, the little, a little note that says five bucks. That's, that was their marketing campaign that they missed out on. Yeah. The record store, yeah. five bucks. The weed shop. The, yes, the weed shop. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, it's unfortunate to me after watching the movie because I think it's a very good movie. I think it's really ambitious and uh, unique, most importantly. Like, I can't remember the last time I saw a movie quite like this. Is it ironic that you know, It Follows was the big movie? Is it ironic that this movie comes after that? Never mind, Jay. It means to stay quiet. Our world is filled with codes, subliminal messages, from Silver Lake to the Hollywood Hills. I guess we should explain what the movie's about a little bit. Well, where do we start with this movie? I think the, the decision to kind of like not put a lot of money behind it was probably smart. At um, least let people know it's out though. Well, the thing is like you said, watch Under the Silver Lake. I was like, okay, I looked at the Rotten Tomatoes, I always do that. Um, I don't know why. I don't really care about the, the actual uh, critical response. Yeah. And that, it, they, it was like 50, 50. 50 I saw, I was looking at IMDb reviews where it's like one or two out of 10 or 10 out of 10. That's exactly. the, it's one of those. It was zero stars or five stars, back and forth, back and forth. Yeah. This movie's dumb as shit, it's boring as fuck. You know, I, uh, I, I stopped it halfway through. And I finished my Domino's pizza in silence. I was so <laughs> mad. And then it's like, it's like, really good work of art. And I'm like, oh yeah. If it's, if it's half the audience hates it, half the audience loves it, I don't know what's going to happen. There's and, a good chance it's, it's going to at the very least be interesting. Exactly. Um, and so, yeah, if it, if it, it's going to be either really smart or terrible. And, um, and then, yeah. And that was just, I, I, I didn't read a single other thing about this movie. And normally, when Jay recommends a movie to me, there's like a 1% chance I'll actually like it. Because <laughs> uh, you like some weird 
you you like I, I'm not gonna be negative. I don't say you like weird sex pervert movies or, or creepy things that make no sense. Uh, you know, I'm more of like I'm a narrative guy. I like structure. I, I like my twists and turns, but I like to very clearly understand what's happening in a movie. You're more of a sensory guy. You like uh, this has a certain feeling to it. And for once, I, I sort of flip flopped, and I felt like. There were lots of things in this movie that I just didn't understand, and there was lots of it I did, and I got the overall gist of it. I can I could see how a lay person would just be like angry at this movie, um, but I, I really loved the style of it, and kind of like the overall message behind it. Well, that's uh, it's funny that you mentioned like, mentioned that you normally like kind of a clear cut story or like to understand exactly what's happening because that's kind of what this movie is about is trying to to find meaning or try and find understanding. Uh, specifically in like pop culture stuff. Um, like you said, you said this movie is very old Hollywood. And yes. yes. Boom, 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 boom. Symbolism all over the place. Old movie posters. His mom's calling him up. Oh, I really love this old movie. He says, what? The music, the score. The score is great. One. The same composer that did uh, It Follows, but completely different type of music. It's yeah. very old, like Hitchcock, uh, uh, Bernard Herrmann. Yeah. yeah. Um, spoilers from here on out, everybody. <laughs> So there's the story of the culty part of it, and really it's very metaphorical for how Hollywood like eats up and spits out women. Yes, which is interesting um, because one of the things I saw as a complaint about this movie, people were saying it was sexist. I was like, no. <laughs> and see, that's the thing. I didn't read a single word anywhere about this movie. I didn't and, read that till after I watched it and I was right. surprised to see that. And this is kind of like, because one you have, well there's the, what, what your legacy is, you as an idol, like idolizing people. Yeah. Because uh, there's the Kurt Cobain, he's fucking that girl where there's a Kurt Cobain poster on the wall. Yeah. And, he's, and uh, he idolizes the girl on the, the Playboy. Um, th there's there's so much imagery of that. They go to the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. Um, there's all the, the gravestones of the famous people. They go to that underground party where all the tables are tombstones of old celebrities. Yeah. Yeah. Even all the statues of the astronomers at the, at the Griffith Observatory, in a way, is you know, you're creating statues of people. There's the James Dean statue. Yeah, both of those play a big part in right. him having decoding and getting noticed by the, yes. the hobo king. The hobo king. <laughs> <laughs> Completely different kinds of of idols, and then it's like um, uh, him and his love of the girl. That, that which is I love, and that's how I don't understand how anyone could misinterpret it at the end, because the whole idea is he's surrounded by all these different women. He has all these different relationships with. There's the uh, struggling actress that comes over, and they just have sex once in a while. His uh, his hippy dippy older neighbor lady that he knows, and then the new girl that he only meets once, and then. She vanishes, and that's the one he becomes obsessed with and kind of sets this whole thing off. Well, he, he himself is sort of an objectifier. Oh, yeah. That's, and, it's and he's very masturbating rear a lot. window with him looking out yeah. the, you know, the, the, the binoculars. The, the nude cat lady is sort of like kind of like a fallen idol, maybe. Probably was in movies when she was younger, but isn't super famous and lives in a dingy apartment. Um, and so, yeah, and he's looking at her boobs. He's looking down at the pool. But when he first meets her, it's a very Hollywood-esque, old Hollywood-esque shot. She comes out. And she's like perfectly lit, like Captain Kirk lit. And she's got that old <laughs> old hat on, the yeah, Kentucky yeah. Derby hat. And she's like, ooh. And then there's even that, in his dream or in his mind, there's that shot where she comes out of the pool. Yeah. And it's the Marilyn Monroe shot. And so they spend a brief amount of time together, barely anything. Mm -hmm. And then he becomes obsessed with her, almost like a fan encounter with a celebrity. Right. So she's almost a celebrity to him, even though she's really not. Yeah. So he's well, that's just because of his kind of view of women, and she's like, she looks perfect as far as he yeah. can tell. Yeah. And he's idolizing her, and he yeah. doesn't really know why. And she's like, she's like, yeah, we don't really know each other. Well, that, that's at the very end when he finally gets yeah. in touch with her, and that's yeah, he's like, I've been looking everywhere for you. I've I've been looking for you. Really? You hardly know me. Yeah. <laughs> That's like the, the, the cap to the whole thing. Right. And then there's the, there's the you know, hit you right on the head scene or shot when he's, I think he's, is he walking or, or driving his car? And there's like 
uh, movie auditions in some like filthy garage. Oh yeah, there's yeah. like an old fat guy. <laughs> it's and it's like a cigar, and, it's, and there's like girls, and they're all dressed the same. They were probably told how to dress, wear this short like mini skirt, and and wear this particular outfit. And they're walking like zombies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very it follows ish kind of shot, walking like zombies to go to this casting, uh, this audition, mm -hmm. and then so it's and then the end of the movie. The, the big reveal at the end, it's its basically the Hollywood Hills or the, 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 the hill with the Hollywood sign on it is, is, a, is a tomb yes. to, to virginal female sacrifices to the modern day pharaohs, which are Hollywood moguls or rich white dudes, <laughs> old white dudes, your Harvey Weinsteins say yeah. you. Uh, uh, and it's like this has been going because there's imagery of uh, pyramids, Egyptian the pharaohs, the Anubis statue, all that stuff. And it's like this this sort of thing of like taking taking you know your concubines or your uh, uh, harem with you when you yeah. die and all you you can ascend like a pharaoh. And he's crawling up those tunnels, and the, like the, the Egyptian pyramids had the, the shafts, you know, to shoot your soul up into heaven or whatever. Some people think they were giant space batteries. Uh, all this nonsense. So, <laughs> so the underground Hollywood Hill mausoleum tunnels, underground things are very similar to Egyptian tombs. Yes. Which what were what the pyramids were. And so, and it was very 2001, that big empty room with the bed at the end. Of yeah, this. yeah. Well, it's again, like, like I was saying, the idea of like everyone just trying to find meaning in things. Andrew Garfield's very into like finding hidden codes. She's uh, a little more susceptible to, like as she says in that scene when she's talking to him on the phone, she's like, well, I'm down here now. I might as well make the best of it. She's just yeah. sort of like going with, you know, whatever is comfortable and easy. Well, yeah, she's tr everyone's trying to achieve greater fame. Mm. There, I mean, there's his old girlfriend who's on, she's on the billboards. Ads. Yeah. But those things, I don't think, like, and, and that's the stuff that could probably be seen as frustrating because he's basically following a trail of clues mm -hmm. um, that sort of makes sense. Uh, the, one of the funnest scenes in the movie that I think makes almost no sense is when he meets the songwriter. <laughs> yes. I created so many of the things that you care about. The songs that give your life purpose. And well, he's the one who talks about, I've been doing this for forever, writing all these, yeah. you know, songs and putting codes into songs, which is so bizarre because it's, it's clearly a guy in old age makeup. And I was trying to figure out, I was like, is that a celebrity cameo? Like, who is this guy? He's like just some random actor man. There's one of two reasons. <laughs> Reason number one is they needed a prosthetic head for him to smash open. <laughs> but the real reason I think he needed a, 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 a songwriter that was so old he wrote songs going back to like, I don't know, Chubby Checker. And, yeah. You know, like, and so you you can't find a 98 year old actor who could do that kind of dialogue and be that kind of animated like the guy is. So you that have makes to, sense. You have to take an old guy and just dump tons like like fucking Emperor Palpatine. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, I think, the point, because he's, he's playing songs from like the 50s. Yeah, yeah, and then he's doing like the Cheers theme, yeah. and he's going through all these things that he's the real person that wrote all these songs. But, and the most uh, recent example of a song he wrote was the band in the movie, which is Jesus and the Brides of Dracula or something like Jesus that. Jesus and the Brides of Dracula. Yeah, yeah, so it's another Jesus, you know, trying to find meaning in life. Idolatry. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, there's, there's, and heavy, there's the heavy. dog killer that's a running thing throughout the that, movie. That I got parts of because it goes back to him. He was, when he was a kid, he got bit by a dog. Half of me is wondering if he is the dog killer and he doesn't know it, mm. but he got bit by a dog and then his girlfriend uh, had a dog and he was kind of longing for her still, and that's why he kept yeah. the dog biscuits. Mm -hmm. If he ever ran into a dog, he would probably want to give it a dog biscuit and scratch its ears right. and make get back in her good graces. And then, so he had sort of a thing with dogs. I just look at his dog as God spelled backwards. Well, there's that too. Because that's like, I think that's the first shot of the movie. You see someone wrote on the window, beware oh, the dog yeah. killer, but you're looking at it from the other side, yeah. so it's reversed. Uh, so. it was, and with but it, on a literal level, that's one of the, the, it almost feels like a red herring, like that's one of those plot lines that doesn't really come back later. That, that's the important part is literal level. Yeah. Because he follows a series of clues 
from like like cereal box map, <laughs> like that that's part of a Nintendo Power magazine that that shows the to the location, secret location of the the um, the the tent where you go to. Yeah. Like and the girls are dressed in like um, it's very cult like. They, they're they small look like, white, like Roman orgy outfits, yeah, or yeah, like yeah. I don't know, sirens from the Odyssey. Like there's all sorts of symbolism going on. But they drink <laughs> the magic tea that knocks them out. They're next in line to spend six months underground in preparation for their culty suicides. Yeah. So that's the map that leads him there. And then it's like, well, if you're like some, some super successful mogul or businessman or whatever, god king, man king, who's going to, you know, go through this process, you're not going to pull a map out of a cereal box and, <laughs> and play a song backwards. Yeah. All that's all the secret coding seemed pointless. Mm. It was fun, yeah. but plot-wise, uh, uh, logically, it didn't make any sense other than just fuel for the story to yeah, move forward. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, this is, it's like a, what do they call that, magical realism or something, and it's slightly surreal, but the idea that, like, yeah, all these big Hollywood people have been working in codes that they didn't think anyone would ever crack for, for decades, so yeah. it, it connects to that. <clears throat> the idea that... Uh, I guess if you're wondering why they would put the codes in things to begin with. Mm. I guess that's why the movie's description, it's like, Under the Silver Lake, drama, comedy, action, horror. It's everything. <laughs> the question mark, question mark. Yeah. But it, 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 to me, it all flowed together really well. It didn't feel like disjointed tonally or anything. Yeah, it, it, keeps, it keeps a good pace going. Uh, when he makes it to that, that songwriter's mansion, that's where it kind of turned a corner for me. Yeah. And... Um, I got more out of the overall like Hollywood is is a big evil cult that that sucks up unsuspecting women and yeah. and, and sacrifices them to the gods of, of idolatry. Yeah, well, that's basically a... the message, and it's like okay. Yeah, that's true. It's all, it's all icky. <laughs> it's, it's yeah, yeah. Especially like now, like recent times in the wake of like yeah. uh, the Weinstein stuff, and then even on a smaller level, you have like the. Uh, the, the, the three actresses that they're they're in a movie that's playing at the Hollywood Cemetery, but it turns out they're also like call girls. When I go down on the girlfriend of the lead in your favorite sitcom, call shooting the star. Which is like, ugh, I mean, there's some people that kind of view actresses just as that, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a message in the music. Really think you're going to find a hidden message in a pop song? Yeah, all that stuff. I mean, it, yeah, just as a movie about Hollywood in a way that isn't... You've seen plenty of movies about Hollywood or that take place in Hollywood, but one that kind of uh, gets to this sort of like, ooh, it's pretty disgusting. It's, it's not... It's, it's no La La Land. <laughs> it's, it's the anti-La La Land. It's the anti-La La Land. <laughs> but they don't, they don't hit you over the head with that either, that, like... He doesn't like walk by when they're doing the Oscar red carpet, and they have all these like ooh shots of celebrities. Yeah. And, like, oh no, that's it's, it takes place in so it's under the Silver Lake. Just, it takes place in like the dirty outskirts of, of Los Angeles. Yes. It's it's like uh, the, like the, the Florida LA. Project, right? Yeah, yeah. A little bit where the, the it's in the shadow of Disney World, where mm -hmm. it's like yeah, we, we all like this thing exists and it's it's impacted all of our lives in some way, but we don't really interact with it. It's just there. Yeah. This monolith of, of awful. <laughs> um, it's just there in our lives. We're in the shadow of it. Honey, how are you? Mom, I'm fine. Mostly fine. Um. Why do we assume that all of this information is what we're told it is? Normally, uh, a non, not very narratively logical movie would sort of annoy me. The, and then this, this, this was kind of riding the line in the first half between like, there's lots of annoying hipsters in it. Yes. And I'm just like, is this like? Which ends up being purposeful, of course. But yeah, is is this? Is this hipster Kubrick thing? <laughs> is this guy full of himself? Um, but it, it really kind of solidifies in the second half, mm. and and all the codes and you know nonsense with this and that, all kind of add up to that overall overall feeling that I got of like icky. Yeah. And and kind of like his his resolution at the end is just sort of like. 
I can't stop this. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'll go sleep with this has-been lady. I guess so. <laughs> well, she has the parrot that uh, is saying something, and no one can figure out what the parrot is saying. So there's that's still uh, that element is still there of trying to find meaning. I always thought it was saying au revoir, au revoir. Oh. While ridiculous, like us, we should kind of compare this to that. Yeah. That's a movie with hidden symbols all over the 11 11s everywhere and and the, but at the end it's the, the like, logistics of what is happening at the end you can't look at it completely realistically the logistics of yeah the entire underground community of people that match the ones above what they're wearing at the exact same time it's, it's all ridiculous logically yes the the the, the notion that there is a underground society under the hollywood hills of <laughs> you know ah ah the satellite image was blocked out. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> so would, someone would notice that. Um, ridiculous. But what you got at the end with movies like this, that are that are highly coded and you know, is is the overall feeling you get at the end. Yeah. And that's that's where the movie finally triumphed for me. It's a lot. Like I said, there's a lot of plot threads. Some of them don't pay off as well as others, but. I mean, it, it, when a movie is like, I don't know, I just get excited to see something that feels so like different and unique and ambitious, uh, especially these days, where it's like, it's a shame that, you know, this just got like dumped and nobody's talking about it. I'd, ra I'd rather see a big, sloppy, imperfect movie that's really interesting and has something to say, you know, than uh, uh, Detective Pikachu. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, and, that's, and that's why we're talking about We're this not movie. talking about Detective Pikachu this week, no, everybody. Everyone wanted us to talk about Detective Pikachu. We're talking about Under the Silver Lake. I can make a guarantee that we will never, ever, ever talk about Detective Pikachu. You can also guarantee we're never going to talk about the Sonic the Hedgehog movie when that comes out. Uh, meow? I could give two fucks <laughs> about what Sonic the Hedgehog looks like in a movie where the movie looks a billion times worse. Yeah, who cares about the design of that creature? Whoever cut that trailer was like self-sabotaging the movie. <laughs> it's so bad. Half of the trailer is devoted to one sequence of Jim Carrey improv. I don't know if you realize who- I'm sorry, Major, what was your name? Benny. Nobody cares! Because the trailer, the trailer has like the violent femmes playing, and I don't even think I saw the trailer. It's a, do, 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 you know, the, the why can't I get just oh, little yeah, cases? Yeah. Uh, but add it up, add it up, because it's you know, yeah, conspiracies and yeah. all that, and, that, and it sort of has a like a like a lighthearted vibe to it. And there's no no music like that in the film. It's right. a little drearier. That's that's a twenty four thing is marketing movies as something they're not. Every horror movie they put out, they find some critic blurb that says it's the scariest movie since The Exorcist. <laughs> I think they said that with The Witch. They said that with, like, It Comes at Night. Mm -hmm. And then general audience sees it and says, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. And The Exorcist isn't scary. It's boring and funny <laughs> because the little girl swears. Um, your mother sucks cocks in hell, Paris. So I don't want to be, like, I don't know, sound like elitist, like, oh, this movie's too good for modern. But you do look at, like, the movies coming out now, and you're like... If that's what people are, can, are used to seeing, what they've kind of become conditioned to, then yeah, something like this doesn't stand a chance. Um, well, that's the silver lining, is that a movie like this is at, ver at the very least still made. You get a, a couple little movies like this every year where you're like, hey, this is interesting and different. Could be worse, we could not get that at all. We have to watch Detective Pikachu five times. You have to watch Detective Pikachu 118 times to beat the world record for how many times you can see a terrible movie in the theater. Mm -mm. Mm, that that would be a marvel if you could beat that record. Yeah, yeah. Someone watched 100 Pikachus, 118 <laughs> Pikachus, uh, animated Pikachu, whatever it is. So you want if you want to, if you want to market a movie is like the Pokemon movie, Pikachu movie. Just make Under the Silver Lake, but Andrew Garfield is a Pikachu. There you go. Yeah. Same exact movie. Same exact movie. No yeah. change. Yeah. No change. No reference that he's an animated character. <laughs> uh, I guess we're at the point where we talk about whether or not people should watch Under the Silver Lake. I think so. Support this movie. Someone needs to see it. It's worth it. It's not just like weird for the sake of weird or anything. It's a, it's an actually yes. engaging story, I think. It's a little slow, but it, it feels like it's about something and building towards something. And Andrew Garfield's really good in it. We didn't really talk about his performance much, no. but he's great. Yeah. Um, this weird for the sake of weird. That's what I hate. That you summed it up. I, could, I, I, I couldn't have said it more. Weird, but accessible. 
Yes. I think that's the key. That's that's like that's like my sweet spot where it's like I like narratives, I like stories that make sense, that have twists and turns and plots I, I can relate to and um, this had a little bit of everything. Because it had a little ticking clock element with his apartment. Oh yeah. You know, certain plot devices that you would see in movies. It had um, a clear progression of story where it's like uh, this clue is leading me to this, yeah. which is leading me to this. A build up, you said, a build up. And not just, oh, this weird thing's happening. Aren't we weird hipsters? Right. This is weird. Lots of weird. <laughs> but it felt like it was building to something. And on top of that, the cherry on top was it had some kind of message or, or, or evoked a feeling yeah. that came out, you know, where it's just like, oh, okay, I, I got this feeling out of this movie. And when a movie isn't a tight, solid, perfect script, but it has a really good, like, look to it, feeling, uh, then, then I like it. Um, so I'm not, I'm not completely opposed to Lynchian weirdness, because um, I like the Twin Peaks reboot, yeah. even though I never watched Twin Peaks. <laughs> I really enjoyed that. And that's that's my that's the stuff that really hits me is the yeah where it really evokes like a very specific feeling that you don't get a lot from a lot of other movies. Yeah. Uh, as long as you give it the time and don't get angry when all the hipsters are, are floating around. <laughs> Especially Topher Grace's hipster. Oh well, that's a great one. Uh, get out of here. That's one of the, the more humorous moments. Is yeah, he's got a stupid little hat on and they're in his backyard and. He's flying a drone to spy on a woman through her window while also complaining about how everybody is overly paranoid these days. Yes. It's like, yeah, that's great. <laughs> and he's, he's completely objectifying the woman. Yeah. It, it peers in her window and he's like, this, this, this bitch must have been a supermodel or something. And, and, yeah. and then she's, she comes in and just like a t-shirt and her underwear, she takes off her top. She starts crying. And then she starts crying. <laughs> yeah. And then they just awkwardly end. Yes. And, and see, that is not... That is commenting, a scene like that is a perfect example. It's commenting on misogynistic behavior yeah. or objectification of women because they're just like, oh. Yeah. Like, that's what you get, you monsters. <laughs> um, it wasn't like, ooh, funny music starts playing and she takes off her top and everyone's right. laughing and ah, 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 recording it on my drone. It's, it's not a Porky's moment. It's not a Porky's moment. It's It ends with her just crying. Yeah. And so, hey, that. That's a person. Hey, fuck you, seriously. Ah! Go watch the movie, but don't watch it on Amazon. Because <laughs> Amazon <laughs> fucked up the aspect ratio, so I don't know. You can find this movie in Walmart next to the frozen shrimp. Under the silver 